Rock is a musician. He produces music. Spotify, as a Web2 platform, doesn't reward him as he wishes. This is why Rock created his social token called Rock with a dollar sign at the beginning of the word. Social tokens are cryptocurrencies that brand, communities, or influencers can use to monetize themselves. It's a special cryptocurrency associated with the creator, something like a stock for a company. The value of this token depends on the creator online performances, like quality of content they share, hype, likes, comments, generally speaking, the engagement and impressions they get. In fact, the more creator is famous, the more followers will buy, actually invest into his token. Social tokens ultimately turn followers into investors that can buy and sell creators tokens based on their social performances. Exactly what stockholders do with companies, if you think about it. But how does Rock actually make money with social tokens? He gets a percentage every time their fans buy his token. He can sell tokens he owns. His followers want to spread the word when he releases new albums. But why? Because followers are stakeholders of his coin. It's in their interest to spread the word. Basically, they want him to succeed so that Rock Token's value increases as well. But on the other hand, what had the benefits for the followers? As holders of the token, fans can access premium content, such as early access to music, live concerts, or private connection with them, for example, like live calls, private chats, and things like that. Some artists provide recurring dividends depending on the percentage of the tokens their fans own. As investors, they can trade tokens. Who believed in Rock at the beginning of his career and purchased his token when the price was low can now sell it at a higher price. You can think about this also as a way to back artists and creators with talent, but not famous yet. In this scenario, social tokens help creators make money, not because they have millions of followers, but because they are talented and people believe they are going to do great things. So let's talk about DAOs. A DAO stands for Decentralized Autonomous Organization. Bit of a mouthful, so I'm just going to refer to them hereafter as DAOs. And it's an entity with no central leadership. I know what you're thinking, it's not exactly an online version of the Wild West. In fact, it's governed by its members, a community that's organized around a specific set of rules enforced on the blockchain. So how does it all work? Well, it typically starts with the creation of a smart contract. And you can think of this smart contract as a little like a charter. It outlines the purpose of the DAO and the rules by which it operates. We'll talk a little bit more about smart contracts later on because it is an important topic to cover in the Web3 space. Being on the blockchain means that the rules are set in stone unless they're amended through the governance system. And you guessed it, that's outlined in the smart contract. After the smart contracts have been created, the DAO needs to determine a way to receive funding. And this usually uh, involves crypto tokens being sold, they raise some funds, and then those people that hold those tokens have then got some voting rights in terms of what actually happens with the DAO. Uh, it's a little bit like owning shares in a company. Once everything is set up and the DAO is deployed on the blockchain, from this point onwards, stakeholders decide on the future of the organization. And this is a very critical point. It's not the organization's creators, those people who first wrote that smart contract that hold all of the influence and power. They don't have any more influence and power on the project in any more of a way than the other stakeholders. Of course, it is all tied to the voting rights, which would be tied to the issuers of tokens. So similar to shares, if somebody owns 80% of the shares, they've probably got 80% of the power, that sort of thing. Decisions are made via proposals, the group votes on during a specified period, and the money gets controlled by via a built-in treasury. And that is only accessible with the approval of its members. So things like fraud are pretty hard to achieve. So what are some of the key issues that get solved with the DAO versus a traditional entity? Well, a traditional organization requires a lot of trust in the people behind it. And this is especially uh, true on behalf of investors. But they're removed from the day-to-day -day running of the organization. So they need to have a lot of trust in the people that are running it. 
With a DAO, you only really need to trust the code itself, you know, the code that sits on the smart contract. Because every action that a DAO takes after being launched has to be approved by the community and it's completely transparent and verifiable. A lack of hierarchy means any stakeholder can put forward an innovative idea and the entire group will consider it, improve upon it, vote it in, reject it. And internal disputes are often easily solved through a voting system. And this is in line with pre-written rules in the smart contract. So it's a critical thing that if you are going to set up a DAO, that you pay a lot of attention to the smart contract because that will either set you up for success or failure down the line. Members of a DAO have their interests aligned to the DAO as the nature of the DAO incentivizes them not to be malicious, but rather turn into advocates of the organization. And for me, this is one of the critical benefits of a DAO. Let's look at the example of a community. If it's governed by a DAO, the members of the community would be incentivized to be active. They would be incentivized to promote the community to new members and to help. So not only do they get the benefits of this thriving community that they're, that they're a part of, but they're also rewarded since they'll have a financial stake. So the success of the community becomes their success and they're rewarded with things like the token that they purchased growing in value over time. Now, I know what you're thinking, this sounds brilliant. It's all brilliant in practice, but do members want to vote on every single issue? Do we want this sort of very pure democracy here? Well, look, probably not. Once an organization grows to a decent size, there's just too many decisions that need to be made and voting on every single decision would become this massive bottleneck. So what a DAO can do is delegate authority in a similar way to shareholders delegating authority to a board or CEO in a traditional organization. Although there is one key difference and that's that you've got the full transparency of the decisions that are made and all of those checks and balances in place uh, because everything is sitting on the blockchain. So you're able to follow the money and not just rely on this carefully crafted report as we often see uh, with traditional organizations. There are some uh, hurdles to widespread adoption though. DAOs can be distributed across multiple countries and jurisdictions. They're kind of, you know, the internet native. They don't fall within any particular kind of geography. So there's no legal framework for them. And legal issues that may arise will be probably pretty complicated to solve. There are countries that are starting to look into how they can support the adoption of DAOs as a new governance system, because as we've just seen, there's a number of upsides. But I expect that this would take some time to become commonplace. One of the massive issues that we see with DAOs though, is that third party transactions outside of the Web3 space are pretty difficult to achieve because there's no legal entity to enter into contracts like hiring staff in a traditional way or opening a bank account. So you would need to employ an agent to act on your behalf. And then that kind of erodes some of the value proposition as you start to reintroduce all these activities that happen off the blockchain and then you've got points of failure like transparency fraud and so forth in the us it's a com it's a completely different story so the sec issued a report in 2017 determining that DAOs that have sold security in the form of tokens kind of how it works violated portions of the securities laws. So you just need to be very careful if you're in the US or a citizen of the US. But I do encourage you if you are looking to start a DAO to check how that may all sit in your country. DAOs do have the potential to change the way corporate governance works completely. There's a massive future for them. But I think, look, it's going to take some time for the concept to mature and this legal gray area where they operate today to be cleared. More and more organizations will probably adopt the DAO model to help govern some of their activities as time goes on and expand this over time versus just going headfirst into the deep end from day one. So NFTs, you've probably got some questions about this emerging um, art platform, right? Look, you've no doubt seen headlines about people paying house money for a clip art of a rock or doodles that you'd be proud of your four-year-old for creating and you're probably thinking what the hell is going on this makes absolutely no sense well there's more to it than that but first let's go through and 
understand exactly what an NFT is. So an NFT is a non-fungible token, which probably still makes no sense to you. But the easiest way to explain it is if you imagine an NFT being a one of a kind trading card, it's unique. And if you were to trade it for another trading card, you'd get something different in return. Whereas Bitcoin, for example, is fungible. If you have one Bitcoin and I have one Bitcoin and we swap our Bitcoins, we still both have the exact same thing that we started with. NFTs sit on the blockchain, which most likely today would be on the Ethereum blockchain, but that's changing and we're seeing NFTs pop up on other blockchains too in an, in an effort to reduce transaction costs. And we'll get into that a little bit later on. The main difference between say an NFT and a cryptocurrency uh, like Bitcoin or Dogecoin or, or any of these meme coins is that there's a little bit of extra information stored on the blockchain metadata, and that can link to digital assets. It could be an image, a video, a GIF, whatever. So Christie's, the famous auction house, auctioned off a 10 second video by Beeple and it sold for $6.6 million. Yes, I just had to check I was reading that right. That's 6.6 .6 million US dollars. And here it is. The awkward thing is that you can download the exact same file that the owner received. It's mind blowing, but NFTs are designed to give you something that can't be copied and that's ownership of the work. Okay. So the artist can still retain copyright and reproduction rights, just like they would with a physical artwork, but let's put this in terms of physical art collecting. Anyone can buy a Monet print, but only one person can flex that they own the original. So is there any more to it than that? Well, look, it can be argued that one of the earliest NFT projects, CryptoPunks, they've also got a bit of a community around them. There's various other animal theme projects like Board Ape Yacht Club. They've also got a bit of a community around them as well. The activities of these communities do vary from one to the next. But if we take Board Ape owners, for example, it seems to involve vibing and sharing memes on Discord, complimenting each other on their Twitter avatars, that sort of thing. So you might be thinking, what's the point to all of this? Look, I think it really depends on whether you're an artist or a buyer. Let's say you're an artist, you might be interested in NFTs because it gives you a novel way to sell work that there otherwise wouldn't be much of a market for. You may come up with a really cool digital sticker idea, but how are you going to sell it? You could sell it on the iMessage app store, but you might struggle to get much in return. So people are doing these sorts of things and, and doing very well out of it today. But I think it's worth noting that a lot of this success may be short lived. If you're an unknown artist and you're putting these sorts of things in NFT marketplaces, you might be able to make some cash today, but you may not survive the hype when marketplaces become oversaturated and it's coming. One of the key features for artists though, is that you can enable a royalty. So you get a percentage every time your NFT is sold. And this makes sure that if your work gets super popular and the value skyrockets, you'll see some of that benefit as well. And this is unlike traditional art where you, know, you could be an unknown artist and sell a painting for hundred dollars today and then become widely successful in the decades to come for that artwork to later sell for a million dollars. But you, the artist would still have only made hundred dollars. In this case, every time it trades hands, it's built into this NFT that you're going to get whatever royalty you set, 5%, 10%, 80%. Typically royalties for art seems to be somewhere between five and 10%. So every NFT is unique, right? Well, technically, yes, every NFT is unique, but there's a unique token on the blockchain, but it's also possible for collections to be released. So you could release 50 or a hundred of numbered copies of the exact same artwork or derivatives of the same artwork. And this is what we're seeing quite a lot of, you know, the number of copies though is transparent. And then that of course influences the value. From a buyer's perspective, one of the obvious benefits of buying art just in general, is that it lets you financially support the artists that you like. So this is true with these NFTs as well. Buying an NFT also usually gets you some basic usage rights, like being able to post the image online or set it as your profile picture. Plus, of course, you've also got those bragging rights that you're the one that owns the art and you've got a blockchain entry to back it up. But you know, NFTs are like any other speculative assets, like a painting, right? You can resell them for a profit as well if the demand is there. And there's already marketplaces popping up, such as OpenSea.io, where people are trading NFTs today. 
So what do I think of NFT art? Well, look, I'm probably not going to go and start parting with my hard earned money to fill my crypto wallet with clip art of rocks. But what I am excited for is how people use NFTs in new and novel ways in the you know, months and years to come. For example, we're already starting to see NFTs being used in games, and this is for the game creators to be able to sell unique items, like it could be a particular gun or a special helmet or some clothes or something like that. You can purchase this NFT, which gives you the use to use it. And then you can also trade this as well. So you've got something to kind of flex. And this is something that people in that space do appreciate. We've also seen in the metaverse where companies are selling virtual plots of land that could then be developed by the owner in the future or traded or whatever they might may like to do with that virtual plot. There's also been some attempts at connecting NFTs to real world objects. And I think this is where things start to get really interesting. And we're starting to, to move away from some popular, but perhaps short lived uses of NFTs today. So if we look at Nike, they've, uh, Pated a method to verify sneakers authenticity using NFTs and they call it crypto kicks. And we're also starting to see some other luxury uh, goods providers do similar sorts of things as well. Uh, there's also people using NFTs for all sorts of other sorts of things today. So think of event tickets and it could be physical or virtual. You can also sell media like music, TV shows, movies. And what we're also starting to see actually growing quite a lot in the last few months is people selling NFTs to access a paid community or to access a particular SaaS tool. The opportunities really are endless. And I genuinely think that we'll start to see some really cool uses of NFTs in the near future. And it's definitely not gonna be constrained just to $1 million cat doodles. Okay, so I told you I was going to talk about smart contracts. So bear with me for a moment as we get a little bit more technical. There is some method to my madness, and I promise it's important background knowledge for some of the later sections. So the architecture of Web3 applications, or more commonly dApps or dApps, are completely different from Web2 applications. And if we look at a popular Web2 site like Medium, it's a simple blogging site that lets users publish their own content uh, and also interact with content from others. There's a few things that need to go on behind the scenes for a website like Medium to work. First, there must be a place uh, to store all of the data. So that's all of the user's information, the content of those posts, comments, likes, and, and all that sort of stuff. And this requires a constantly updated database. Second, we've got backend code, and that's written in a language like Node.js, and this defines all of the business logic. For example, what happens when a new user signs up, what happens when they publish a new blog, they comment on someone else's blog, that sort of thing. And then third, we've got front-end code, and this is typically written in a combination of JavaScript, HTML, and CSS, but there's a bunch of other different languages as well, but you get the idea. This defines what the site looks like and what happens when a user interacts with the site, whether when they click on a button, what the color of the button is, all that sort of stuff. And we put all of this together. And when you write a blog post on Medium, you interact with the front end, which then talks to its back end. And then the back end talks to the database. And all of this code is typically hosted on a centralized server. So to be something like AWS or Google Cloud, and you as the user interact with it through the through the web browser, Chrome, Safari, Internet Explorer, if you're if you're game enough, and that's kind of how it works. And this is a pretty good high level example of how most Web two applications work today. So, what's the difference with Web three? How does a how does it work in the Web three world? Unlike Web two applications, such as the Medium example, Web three eliminates the middleman. There's no centralized database storing all of the data. There's no centralized web server where all of that backend logic resides. And I can look probably give you a far more lengthy and comprehensive explanation. But at a high level in Web three, you can write smart contracts, and that defines all of the logic of your applications, and then you deploy those onto the blockchain. The traditional web servers and databases are no longer needed because everything either happens on or around the blockchain. So smart contracts are, are written in code and you know, a popular language to, to write a smart contract in is Solidity, which has a lot of similarities with JavaScript, but it's not JavaScript. And then sitting over the top of that is the front end. Now the front end doesn't really change a great deal from what it is today. Um, and those th two things together become your dApp. All right. So now that covers the most 
basic implementation of Web3, but there is one thing that we haven't mentioned yet, and that's storage. So storing everything on the blockchain gets really expensive really, really quickly. So once you kind of move beyond simple text, which you can quite happily store on the blockchain, you will want to store, you know, much larger files. So if you've got images and videos and things like that, you typically would store those files on a peer to peer network called IPFS and then save the location of that file to the blockchain. Okay, so the future of the web is web 2.5 and not three. Okay, so web three purists are probably going to try and find me in a dark alley after watching this video and, you know, break my kneecaps for saying it. But yeah, look, I really believe that the future of the web is most likely going to be somewhere in between what we have today and this pure version of Web3 based on what we know and where technology is at, but it could all change. It's a little bit like this image uh, that you can see there where you've got this multi-generational effort to get the task done. And I'll take you through a detailed example a little bit later on exactly why Web3 isn't suitable for all projects. Please don't hurt me fanboys, it's true. But in the meantime, let's just look at a very simple and stupid debate, at least in my opinion, that's happened not that long ago. So BitCloud, and for those of you in, that are not familiar with BitCloud, it styles itself as the crypto social network. It's built on a blockchain called Deso, and Mateo will talk about Deso a little bit later on because they're doing some really cool stuff and we want you to know about it. Anyway, BitCloud, it's not fully decentralized, but you know, it's just kind of clearly playing in this Web3 space. And there's kind of this expectation from people that it's pure Web3. And it's upset a few people for no good reason, in my opinion. So if you look into BitCloud's documentation, it states that there's parts of BitCloud that are centralized or semi-centralized, and there are parts that are completely decentralized. So things like storing of images and videos are centralized today and stored in a similar way as you would in the Web2 space. They say they'll look to decentralize everything in time and move away from these centralized servers. And they've come up with this fancy term to describe this, which I think a lot of people are probably going to use in the next uh, few years called progressive decentralization. But you've got to ask, what's the point of going down that path other than being able to claim that you're fully decentralized? What benefit does it give you? Should you even bother at all? Well, uh, I don't think that there's anything wrong with that from a technical perspective, as in there's nothing wrong with taking this hybrid approach. In fact, it's a good idea to use centralized servers where it makes sense, since they're far more efficient and cheaper. So my advice is always going to be to use the best solution for the problem at hand and not attempt these one size fits all pure approaches because it's just not needed. There will be plenty of good reasons to use Web3 over Web2, plenty of them. But if you're storing something like a photo for someone's profile, does anyone really care if that sits on an AWS server? Even if that AWS server blows up, very unlikely, probably also backed up, and that photo is lost in this hypothetical situation. Or if someone was to hack in and make a change to it, change your photo to a picture of a cat. Sure, look, it's not nice, but it's probably not going to happen and it probably doesn't warrant this extra effort and mind you cost of putting it on the blockchain. The only thing storing something like that on an AWS server uh, does is undercut all of this high minded talk about Web3 decentralization. On the flip side, if you're running an app, uh, let's say that it stores entry and exit data for uh, a high security government building. Well, there's clearly a strong case to, to leverage the blockchain for that. So you know, be smart about it and use the right thing. Don't attempt these one size fits all approaches. All right, so by now you might be wondering, how can I access the Web3 as a regular user of the internet? Well, the first step in your journey is to acquire a Web3 wallet. Web3 wallets are an essential part of interacting with Web3 and you really won't get far without one. Web3 wallets are digital wallets, so they have the ability to store and interact with digital assets. And this includes everything from cryptocurrencies to NFTs, but they also manage your identity online as well, allowing you, you to interact with those uh, apps we just mentioned. There's different types of Web3 wallets. They fall into two like common categories though. So you've either got software uh, or hardware. We're going to focus on the software wallets as they're the most common. The most common digital wallet is MetaMask, which is available as a browser extension and as a mobile app. It allows you to purchase, store, swap, and manage all of your digital assets. It also allows you to connect with dApps, as we've mentioned, and it works a little bit like logging into a site with a social login, like a Google or a Facebook, just a couple of clicks and you're in. 
Without getting into a detailed explanation as to how it works behind the scenes, your crypto wallet essentially holds the private keys needed to access and authorize things on the blockchain. So people may be able to see that your wallet owns an NFT, for example, but it's the private keys that would be stored in the wallet that would be needed to actually transfer it to a different wallet. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna play a short two minute explainer video from MetaMask that should hopefully explain things far quicker, simpler and elegant than I could. Enjoy. This is Sam. Sam uses the internet just like the rest of us. Lots of apps she uses seem to be free, but they actually come at a cost. She knows the internet isn't very secure and strangers own her data. Credit cards are stolen, identities get hacked, she has to navigate a maze of ads just to surf the web, and she knows someone is always watching. But she's heard there's a better way. And then Sam sees it. The promise of a new internet powered by the Ethereum blockchain. An amazing combination of technologies the world is building together that are reinventing how we connect to one another. And it's just within her reach. But to access this new world, she needs the right tools. Meet MetaMask, your connection to the new web. MetaMask is the tool Sam needs to access this new world. It's a key that connects her to new types of applications. It's a wallet that keeps her data and valuables safe and sound. And it's a shield that protects her from hackers and data collectors. With MetaMask, Sam is ready to explore this new internet safely and securely. The possibilities are endless. Sam can use next generation applications that give control back to the users and the community, own her data and move seamlessly between sites, and send money across the world at a fraction of the cost. Create new organizations with new currencies that bind her communities together. Crowdsource projects and art, or invest in other people's creations. Sound too good to be true? Well, with great freedom comes great responsibility. Sam controls her own identity on this new internet. No more new passwords for every site she visits. Just a secret phrase that controls her accounts. This phrase is her login, her password, and her proof of ownership all wrapped up in one. So Sam has to keep it as safe as she possibly can. Now that she's installed MetaMask, Sam's ready to explore the best version of the internet. Vote, crowdfund, buy stuff, publish writing, make art, hire freelancers. What will Sam do first? Whatever she wants. The internet is hers to explore. Welcome to a new kind of internet. Welcome to MetaMask. Despite the large sums of money made by people who own Bitcoin or Ethereum, I've always viewed the Web3 movement as anti-capitalist. That couldn't be further from the truth. The movement is really about doing one of the most capitalist things ever made. I'm talking about cutting out the middleman. Basically, in Web3, we're talking about a more direct connection between suppliers and consumers. And in this relationship, fans, followers, become investors and stakeholders so that creators can actually monetize their social capital and currency. Thanks to NFTs, we can now prove that we have created and own a specific digital asset, unprecedented on the internet. NFTs created supply scarcity and triggered new digital economy dynamics, though the present and the future is 2.5. Web 3 doesn't mean Web 2 goes away, just like Web 2 didn't mean Web 1 went away. Finally, if you remember, we said that Web 1 was read-only because people could only read the content. Then Web 2, we said, is read and write because users generate and consume content on social networks. But how about Web 3? Well, Web 3 is read, write, and home, as you can see in this table here because users can easily create, consume, and own content online. The core ethos of Web3 is intermediation, taking away the middleman by enabling through peer-to-peer -peer social and transactional relationships. The way most value is being created on the web is through communities of people coming together, collaborating, being part of something. With native ownership and payment layers built in, Web3 has the potential to fundamentally rewire the core social and economic structure and deliver on people's and consumers' deep desire to be part of a creator, brand, or passion community in refreshing new ways.
Web3 is forging stronger and more direct connections between creators and fans, turning passive audiences into active members and stakeholders. Creators are looking to engage their fan base in more meaningful and value-enhancing ways, involving them in a co-creating process and sharing the upsides with them. Web3 is allowing a different kind of patronage, with fans turned into equity stakeholders in the combined cultural value and upside. The questions that Web3 people ask themselves are something like, why subscribe when I can invest? Why just participate if I can partake in the value being created? Why just play when I can have a say as well? In Web3 communities, crypto tokens can be used to reward status or contributions and specific utility and privileges can be attached to these tokens to provide additional benefits to token holders. As with equity shares, this could also be linked to certain voting rights or governance permissions. And the attached utility isn't just restricted to the digital world, but can provide access to other benefits in the physical world as well. Community utility tokens combine access to online to offline product and experiences with financial and tradable value. Tokenized community would bridge existing creator economies to become true ownership economies with members, consumers, and fans and joining a direct connection to the creators they love while having a stake in the collective value upside. Ultimately, vibrant and engaged communities are perpetual promoters that drive network effects and positive feedback loops for growing community engagement and acquiring new members. This is why one of the main Web3 promise is that communities will replace ads, marketing, and social media as we know it.